name is Joshua Corman. My day job is to work at uh, Akamai Technologies as the Director of Security Intelligence. Um, a lot of the topic and content I'm going to be going over tonight has nothing to do with my day job. There's parts that do, but a lot of this is research I've done um, as an analyst, as a citizen, um, especially my stuff about Anonymous. So my disclaimer up front is uh, my opinions represent mine alone and may or may not reflect those of my employer. Uh, I, I did put these on Akamai slides simply because uh, convenience. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about fuzzing. I do have some application security interest. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of Rugged in the Rugged Manifesto. Um, we're about to drop the uh, about an 81-page handbook on Rugged that we want to be beat up by the peer community. Um, and really, this is a way to add more. Uh, right now, we have a lot of technical supply. We have very little demand. So Rugged's been very successful for the people who've adopted it in internally getting buy-in from stakeholders that already hate security. They look at security as a negative, as a cost, and as an inhibitor. Uh, and Rugged changes the tonality um, and the delivery, and it's more focused on cultural aspects and fostering demand. So people who have been unsuccessful uh, getting true buy-in on an application security program, or SDLC, have been very successful using the, the Rugged approach. But I'm not talking about that today. Um, I was asked to talk about adversaries. Uh, a lot of my research centers around different classes of adversaries, so we're going to talk about how conventional wisdom does not stand up well to uh, unconventional adversaries. I talk very, very quickly, um, but I don't mind getting interrupted at certain parts. Uh, one of my goals as a person this week is to find collaborators. Um, I tend to focus on the security that I think is of consequence. Most of our security industry is focused on the far end and the most replaceable asset types, pretty much credit card data. I'm the guy who called PCI the No Child Left Behind Act for Information Security because I think that we focus on the easy problems or on the regulated problems at the opportunity cost and neglect of much more serious asset types, less replaceable or even irreplaceable asset types. So you'll see when I talk about anonymous and whatnot, it's not necessarily the biggest threat to your organization, although it might be, depending on what you've done. Um, it's more a matter of, I think this affects my way of life, my kids' lives, my rights, surveillance, state, censorship, and, and the like. Uh, so, a lot of my research tends to focus on the things we ignore as an industry, and if there's anybody who also feels that uh, they have that protector gene in their DNA, uh, please find me because I need help on some of these more altruistic endeavors. Um, so, who can give me the caption of this? Anybody? Quick? Quick? I'm doing 40 minutes of talk in 30, so. All right, so typically a piece of conventional wisdom, perhaps our most uh, prominent piece of conventional wisdom, is I don't need to be faster than the bear, just faster than my buddy. Who's uttered that? Anybody? Okay. Um, it's total BS. If it was ever true, and it probably was, it's no longer true. So there are two different adversary classes that completely shatter this pretty dangerous dogma. Um, and most of our best practices and rules of thumb and conventional wisdom are predicated on a casual adversary who will act economically and move on to a softer target if you um, are a hard target. So um, I'm not going to get too far into this, but every time someone says APT, God kills a kitten. So um, I call them adaptive persistent adversaries, not just because I was an analyst and I had to come up with my own terms, but because it's more accurate, right? Uh, first and foremost, this is a who and a how not a what, it's not an O-Day, it's not Stuxnet, it's a different methodology. Uh, they're goal-oriented, deliberate, patient, adaptive, persistent, uh, undeterred. One of the best things I wrote as an analyst was a piece explaining what an adaptive, persistent adversary is, uh, basically exploring each of those different characteristics. Um, and if you want some non-sensational, non-FUD type material, um, look at that. But basically, this is what we call you know, the state-sponsored threat, et cetera. I love what Melissa Hathaway says about APT. She says it stands for Average Persistent Threat. Um, and the, the key isn't how sophisticated the attack is, it's how sophisticated the attacker is. An attacker is only as sophisticated as we require them to be, which unfortunately isn't very sophisticated. Um, the second new adversary class is what I call chaotic actors. You know, this can be personified by Anonymous. Oh, by the way, there's some killer artwork in here done by Mar. Um, she did custom artwork for the whole Building a Better Anonymous series. This is my favorite one. She did this one in about 10 minutes. I said, I want a Rorschach of Guy Fox, and this is what I got. Uh, it's, it's awesome. Just stare at that for a while. But she, um, she really helped us codify what we thought was the most important part here and that we see in them what we want to. Um, but chaotic actors don't play by the rules either, and they're not very talented. 
I'm not saying there's no hackers in Anonymous with skills. In fact, there's plenty of Anonymous members here at the conference. Um, some of them actually have some good skills, but most of the attacks that were successful in the public um, coverage of them, especially during the summer of lulls, like lulzsec, um, were pretty basic. They were SQL injection, rudimentary level network layer DDoS, maybe some web defacement, nothing really hard to defend against, and yet they were wildly successful. So these two different classes have something in common. It, you know, this is that cliche picture that uh, Bruce Schneier uses, but essentially, you know, it's still one of my favorites. Uh, when you're dealing with a sentient thinking adversary, you put in a static control and they simply move around them. What's really you know, common between whether it's the, you know, the advanced persistent kitten killers or it's anonymous, it's that there's a level of target stickiness. So they're not going to simply move on. Um, yeah, you might be faster than your buddy, um, but they're more bears than ever. You're drenched in bacon fat and you poked that one in the eye. I mean, this is, this is just a different class. They have a different motivational structure and they act differently. So therefore, the things we used to do don't work for them. It's that simple. Um, I'm not going to give you my zombie talk. I, I gave it last year if you want to look at the Codonomicon thing. I also have it on, uh, just, that's the name of it. But uh, these Picha Kuchas, you're going to see one in a second. They're 20 slides by t times 20 seconds. And I love this one on zo why zombies love PCI. i um, not going to talk about that one, but I am going to do my 20 second times 20 slides on Anonymous. And you're not going to be an expert on it. Actually, no one is an expert on Anonymous. Um, but I put over a year and a half of research into Anonymous, wrote a blog series that took Jericho and I basically a year. We started it at DEF CON last year. Um, and this 20 slides is probably the, the, the most information you can get in six minutes and 40 seconds. So once I hit start, I can't stop. So here we go. Ready? All right. So as an analyst, you might recall uh, a year and a half ago, everyone was terrified to mention Anonymous for fear of retaliation. But on CSO Online, I wrote a piece called um, the rise of the chaotic actor, and I was trying to understand Anonymous after the H.P. Gary federal attacks and what it might mean to the security industry. Um, based on that, we did a, a, con, uh, a talk at DEF CON last year, one year ago, and what we realized after our panel when we went to the Q&A room was half of our panel was dead wrong. It was kind of liberating. We got in a shouting match with some active members of Anonymous. It's kind of awesome. We have a video of the panel and an audio of the conversation. But this was my biggest takeaway. We see in Anonymous what we want to. Our commentary says more about us than it does about them. We project just like the inkblot. And that goes for the members of Anonymous as well. They see in it what they want to. The second big takeaway, now most of us know this, is there isn't an Anonymous. It's a composite. There is no single monolithic Anonymous. Why did they do it? Because there's more than one they. Think of it more of as a brand and a franchise that can be borrowed by anyone and has been. Now, when I wrote the piece, we know a lot more now, but when I wrote it, I couldn't tell. I had a cognitive dissonance. Are they good or are they evil? Well, I kind of liked the fact that they helped uh, oppress people in Tunisia. I kind of didn't like the fact that wives and children of police officers in Arizona were at risk from drug cartel retaliation. So, you know, the, the conversation of the good or the evil was kind of BS. So just like any self-respecting geek, I went to my Dungeons and Dragons 3x3 instead, and I realized it's not just the good versus evil roads, it's also the columns of lawful versus chaotic. And, uh, and, and that's what Anonymous is, is really the chaotic um, nature that is really the hacker zeitgeist. Um, now that includes people like Robin Hood or the Batman trying to work outside the system for good and there's some very honorable folks in Anonymous doing some very honorable things. It also includes people that are more nihilistic or anarchistic and just want to see the world burn. Uh, Mar also did that one in about 10 minutes. It's pretty cool. So uh, the snap judgments that they're all good or all bad just really didn't understand the nature of the group. There's a lot of sex, a lot of anonymous sex, S-E-C-T-S. Uh, Geeko Systems made this beautiful incestuous family tree uh, and you can ogle at it later when you like but there's lots of splintering and resplintering and there's a jester in there and anti-sec and whatnot but look at the root of the tree it's 4chan now a lot of people call anonymous hacktivists which is ostensibly the intersection between activism and hacking the challenge is there's very very few hackers in anonymous and there's very very few activists in anonymous if you've ever been to 4chan's b-boards they have more in common with Cindy Lauper than they do with some noble cause like Gandhi, it's more about having fun. And that was the big takeaway we got from the confrontation last year. Now they do share tools. This is a low orbit ion cannon. They've now graduated to the high orbit ion cannon. Um, but essentially this levies a pretty rudimentary network layer DDoS, but it's effective enough. It's taken down just about everyone they tried to take down. So um, one of the challenges is it doesn't anonymize the users of the, of the cannon. So speaking of cannons, these members um, or users of the tool were cannon fodder uh, and unfortunately they found that they weren't very anonymous in their use and they were arrested 
uh, in participation in the state of California with the Operation Payback, um, attacking PayPal. Um, and there's, they're actually prominently featured in the movie that's going to be screening uh, called We Are Legion at DEF CON on Saturday. Um, they also share a zeitgeist. Um, you know, whether this is deliberate source material or not, well, you should go watch Fight Club again. Um, in that there's a lot of disenfranchised folks and, and uh, feeling powerless and their participation is very invigorating and feels powerful. Um, we talked to some, you know, some central folks, we talked to some peripheral folks, and they're just really addicted to the idea that they're actually making a difference and it, it really is intoxicating. Um, then there's the, also from Fight Club, is the notion of escalation. So some people only operate on a, an op in their neighborhood, like Op BART in, the state of, in uh, San Francisco, but some of them escalate onto more regional or global things, um, even to some transgressive and illegal things. Uh, one example of escalation is, um, when I wrote this, was they were going to take down and erase the New York Stock Exchange from the internet. And while they were unsuccessful, this has powerful and uninformed people in the Beltway um, very rattled. It's showing that they're becoming more brazen and aggressive. Um, one of the challenges we gave at the DEF CON conference was to build a better anonymous and, and choose more you know, honorable targets. Um, one group hurt us, and this group particularly used their knowledge of the financial services industry to um, out a corrupt Chinese agricultural bank. And then I think their second target was a French bank. So they're, they're using knowledge of corruption in their industry. Um, I actually am not, I, unlike others, I don't look at Anonymous necessarily as, as a huge menace. I actually am much more concerned about false flags. Um, in my own analysis, I've spotted several false flags where it was either the Russian organized crime group, the cartels, or as one of these CISOs in the Beltway told me, it's God's gift to China. It, it's easily, it's cover fire for whoever else wants to do something nasty. And it's happened a lot. We've spot, spotted lots of false flags. And then as a, a father and a, and a citizen, I'm much more concerned about some sort of neo-McCarthyism where you know, um, everyone has to say, I'm not now, nor have I ever, member, ever been a member of Anonymous. Um, you know, taking action in, for causes isn't bad. That's part of democracy, whereas some of the guys that took it too far scare the powerful and uninformed people. So I told the group last year and throughout this, so this open source blog initiative that there's a fork in the road. And at some point, you're going to realize that there's a lot of inherent contradictions or uh, inconveniences in the model and that some sort of... Um, organized chaos needed to rise. That if you really wanted to have a higher impact and less risk of incarceration, you know, so out of rational self-interest, we encourage them like Hobbes' Leviathan, the state of nature is the state of war, think Lord of the Flies. Um, and we've been kind of outlining what a better anonymous might look like that could help them meet their goals without as much risk to them and it's not, it's not as much, without as much collateral damage. This is the easy answer slide, it's blank because there aren't any. Um, so instead I, I repurposed it to be the suggested background reading this is a little bit cliche, it's one of the first um, pieces in the ins installment of our blog series. But these are sources that we find either directly sourced material or highly informative on understanding the zeitgeist and the nature um, of what motivates people to join. Now obviously we're not going to solve this in 20 slides times 20 seconds, but if you haven't uh, put some time to think about how this impacts you, you know, yeah, sure, in your day job perhaps, but I care more about my impact on um, my social life and my rights. So this is not going away, it's getting bigger, and it's time to stare into the abyss and figure out what role you're gonna play as things matriculate. So that is the speed talk. It is certainly not everything you need to know, but it's a good foundation, and I'd encourage you to read the rest of the blog series. But a lot of this came out of, um, we were originally gonna confront Aaron Barr. Remember Aaron Barr? Um, he was made fun of on the, um, the Colbert Report for sticking his something in a beehive. Um, he threatened at B-Sides San, San Francisco, I believe, to out the, the names of members of what we later came to know as LulzSec using his open source intelligence, and they destroyed him. He was the CEO of HP Area Federal. HP Area Federal is no more. He lost his job. He almost lost his family. And then six months later, he lost the job he got again. So he, he lost two jobs over this. Um, and we tried to get him to, to stand for his crimes, so to speak. They weren't crimes, but to, to stand an account at DEF CON last year. Um, the lawyers kept him off stage by threatening court injunctions and whatnot, so we kind of repurposed it a little bit. We wanted to have a frank conversation about Anonymous. Um, the panel itself is video archived, you can watch it. It was interesting, we said some interesting things, but boy, we, we got started getting shouted at by one of the members of Anon that runs Op New Blood, and then they came to the Q&A room, which this is manifested here, and although I have a mask, I am not a member. Um, one of them who was originally threatening to attack me 
halfway through said, okay, okay, we understand where you're coming from. You're, you're not trying to judge us, you're trying to help. Um, so that was more of a gesture of uh, conciliation. But we got in a really good frank conversation. We have an audio of this. We finally posted on the final part of our blog series. Uh, the, the bald guy there, second bald guy, I guess, is Jericho. Uh, he runs attrition.org. And he and I spent the better part of a year doing a lot of writing. We basically wrote a small book by accident. Uh, it was meant to be just an open and honest dialogue uh, with Anonymous to say, look, you're going to have some challenges. Brand management's going to be hard. Infiltration's going to be hard. The, the cops are going to try to infiltrate you. Special interests are going to try to infiltrate you. And at first, they, they were skeptical. Then they started listening when things started coming true. And it wasn't manipulative. It was just honest. We said, look, this isn't going away. This is an emergent property of the state of the world and technology. Um, others are going to follow and innovate and repeat. And hopefully, they don't hijack it and turn it into something that they hate, right? And one of the things we were concerned about is if you hate censorship, they were accidentally creating the justification for more censorship. And if they hate surveillance, they were accidentally creating the justification for this. So some of the, the moral anons started engaging us directly, then frequently, um, and it turned into something much bigger than we anticipated. So the, the series is called Building a Better Anonymous, and it's not like we actually know how to do it better, it's just that it, we said if, if Anonymous stumbled into a really interesting and powerful blueprint, how could that blueprint be improved upon for their own uh, best interests? And I certainly am no expert on hacktivism, nor am I an expert on how they should do it. But we just gave them things to think about. And at first, they pushed back. And then later, some of them were very appreciative. Uh, in fact, some of them are actually acting directly upon some of this stuff. And it, and it fits because it went from being really off base to partly off base to improve because we kept talking. I just wanted to get us talking. Um, Vanity Fair just did a piece in May of this year. It's actually readable to business people. It was called World War 3.0, or um, basically it frames the tension between the forces of chaos and the forces of control. And if you think, if for the people that were kind of blindly afraid of Anonymous and the chaos, what you should be much, much more afraid of is some of the attempts to control and regulate the internet. Um, they're very scary, and, and we're actually doing a panel on this piece on uh, Saturday morning at DEF CON at 10 a.m. Um, with the people profiled in the article. But basically, the ITU, which is the International Telecommunications Union, this December is basically going to take a free and open internet that we all tend to enjoy right now and slice and dice it to make it um, conform better to different geos and political um, sovereignty. So they want to introduce taxes and tariffs and surveillance and things kind of like that more resemble the way China and Iran handle their internet segments. And this is not the kind of internet that we're, we're down with. I mean, the, the hacker culture will not stand for something like this. So we think that could be a flashpoint that leads to a lot of escalation. And some of the article is, all, you know, there's lots of different aspects of the article. They profile Jeff Moss, the founder of Black Hat and DEF CON. They profile Vint Cerf, one of the fathers of the internet. They profile me and my research on chaotic actors. And Dan Kaminsky, who's really helped with DNS and pushed DNSSEC. And one of the things we're saying here is that, you know, the internet can't be controlled. And any attempt to only fuels further revolt. So if you think of a tension between the forces of chaos and control, there's this great Commander X quote. Um, he's one of the, the, the more prominent personalities in the street protest aspects of Anonymous. He said, given the choice between tyranny and chaos, I'll choose chaos every day. Well, our retort was, well, don't you realize one fuels the other? So if you think of this more as a Chinese finger trap, right? the harder each side pulls, the worse it gets. And what you have is stupid legislation that you know, maybe protects, like SOPA, for example, protects like the motion picture industry, but really threatens surveillance and privacy. And this enrages and infuriates um, plenty of folks in the hacker community. And Anonymous takes, takes a central role in promoting the anti-SOPA stuff. And then they have PIPA and CISPA and all these different things. And anything that's a threat to the internet, the internet's basically coming back as an immune system and fighting back, which further scares policymakers, which further justifies. So we see this as a very dangerous feedback loop. Um, and we're really going to try to, we think the really serious one is the ITU um, later this year when the UN kind of takes control away from being free. Mm -hmm.